Okay, we're going to kick things off here. It's about 2 o'clock my time. Uh, get this ISFSI happy hour going. Looks like we're getting a, a lot more people jumping online here, so that's a good thing. Um, and if you haven't been on this call yet, I think this is our third week in a row. Um, the format is pretty simple. Um, we've got a couple bullet points that we're going to discuss and try to pay it forward to each one of our membership. Um, it was kind of introduced because we weren't able to do our social at FDIC this year and not get that networking time that we all strive for and kind of get that face time with everybody. So this was a forum to get everybody together to ask questions and share information, again, paying it forward here. So uh, with that, my partner in crime, Jason, uh, we're both on duty. If one of us gets a call, one of us is going to get off and the other one's going to kind of kind of steer the conversation. Kind of the rules of engagement here are if you have a question or something to say, just uh, put it on the chat and I'm gonna be monitoring the chat there and that way I can call on you and everybody please mute your mics now so we don't have any background noise. And then um, when you have a question, fire it off on the chat and then I can, uh, and then you can unmute and we can talk that way. So the theme for this week is kind of the, the training officer 101, um, talking about you know what's required, what struggles, if you, if you have any, or if you're not having struggles, how can we help each other out within this membership and, uh, and making sure everybody's feeling well supported in their training officer uh, journey. And if you're a brand new training officer, this is the right place to be right now as we can really uh, get you hooked up with the right person based on your demographic and move forward. Just a, a quick little introduction for me and I'll turn it over to Jason here is, uh, my name is Seth Barker, I'm the ISFSI vice, first vice president. I'm out in Big Sky, Montana. I'm kind of in the southwest portion of that state. I'm a battalion chief and training officer for uh, 18 short years down there. And I think this happy hour is kind of what I look forward to every week because this this venue, this forum is exactly the reason why I, I walked through the, the door at ISFSI and joined is to, put me in contact with all you guys and asking you guys questions and get out of my bubble that's in the middle of nowhere, Montana, and, and see what uh, the best and brightest in the industry are doing. So, Jason, you wanna do a little intro of you? Hey Seth, thanks. Uh, Jason Coy from Laramie County Fire District number two in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And just to kind of reiterate what Seth said is that uh, one of the strengths of being a part of ISFSI and what I was looking for when I joined was that relationship and information sharing between organizations. And it's not very many organizations are very often where you can interact with people from all over the world and, and recognize that you're not alone in, in your challenges that you face. And so with today's theme, what we thought about was uh, Training Officer 101, some of the lessons learned from all of you that we can share with each other that even though you know I've been in the fire service for 30 years, uh, there's so much more that I learn every day because we get outside of our normal box here in in Cheyenne or like Seth in Montana, and uh, you see something that someone else is doing that becomes a benefit that you could share inside your organization to make your organization stronger or better. And and I see Pete Van Dorps on our president and. Uh, Pete's got a lot of years and uh, a lot of knowledge to share with us too. So um, do, do I guess today we can hope to share those things. Years? Do we always have to talk about how old I am? We just, uh, just, just knowledge, <laughs> that's all Pete, just your knowledge. Okay. You had that at the beginning too, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'm okay. hoping today we, we talk about uh, training 101. What, do we, what have we learned over the years as training officer or what are our questions as new training officers and what are the resources available for us to share with each other. So Seth, that back to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so just remind everybody to please mute your mics. And, and then again, you know, the rules of engagement are type up on the little chat icon there in your top right of your screen, fire off a question, then I'll call on you, and then you can unmute your mic and we can talk that way we're not talking over each other. So I see a couple of mics out there still a little bit hot, just as a reminder. Uh, first question kind of kicking this off is, uh, you know, what is mandatory training for your department? And I realize that gets a little bit muddled with state to state, but, uh, you know, figuring out what you absolutely have to do as an organization or authority having jurisdiction and what we have to navigate based on NFPA standards or, you know, state mandated standards, if you will. Um, I see my good buddy, Drew Smith, my uh, Jedi master in training is on. And Drew, did you have anything to add about that as, well, as far as mandatory training for your department? Well, it's interesting because uh, when we do the training program manager class in Illinois, 
when we talk about mandatory training, we get all kinds of different definitions of what's what is mandatory. So I think two two quick thoughts. The first of which is you really need to define what you mean by mandatory. Um, and then the second thing is, and I, I stole this concept from uh, Northbrook Fire Department, Tim Cassidy and Joel Eaton over there is, um, they have bargaining agreement language about mandatory training and it relates to pay and all this. So they've adopted a term called compliance training and their compliance training are the things like the OSHA requirements and any statutory impositions uh, that, they, that they feel have to be done. And so um, they further define that. So I would say you need, really need to do that needs assessment and you need to decide, you know, who's telling you what you have to do? Who's telling you what you should do? What is it that you as an organization need done? And then what would be nice? Because the reality is there is 10 pounds of stuff to do and you only have a five pound bucket. Uh, you're never going to get it all done in a year. So you've got to fight your battle of what are you going to do in a year? And then what are you going to do on some other type of cycle? And for us in Prospect Heights, it's a 24 to 36 month cycle. We have everything weighed. Another good way to uh, go about this um, is to take every training topic or requirement that you can think of and use Gordon Graham's frequency risk matrix and assign a value to each of them. Is it high risk, high frequency, uh, high risk, low frequency, low risk, low frequency, low risk, high frequency? What's the risk versus frequency? And that'll answer your question because those high risk, low frequency, non-discretionary time tasks are the ones that you gotta do on a more regular basis. And everything after that you can do as you can fit it in the bucket. Yeah, so just to uh, expand on what Drew's talking about, I've really embraced this methodology within our organization and try to pay this for it as well. But Drew did a fantastic job of, of isolating, you know, the NFPA 1001 JPR skills for an entry level firefighter, so to speak, just to use that as an example, and then break them all down into those categories of and have those categories mean something, right? Because just putting something into a category doesn't really mean anything until it has an action behind it. And so what that action is, is if it's a a low frequency high risk skill, we need to be trained. We need to be trained on that on a yearly basis. For example, you know, innovation comes to mind, or um, fire attack, or live fire. And then uh, a a high frequency low risk skill would be fire extinguishers that we can probably hit once every three years, so to speak. So that's kind of where Drew broke all that stuff up um, and. And made it a very a very feasible document for a training officer to follow and kind of have that roadmap moving forward. Um, good stuff. See my other uh, Jedi Master there, Forrest, really jumped on. And uh, Forrest, what do you have to say about this? Is kind of your wheelhouse too about the the mandatory training for your fire department? If you can speak to that a little bit. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, we're we're switching to a, a, a new system here this year in Tinley. And uh, what we've tried to do with that is, is we're breaking down what we're calling the annual core training requirements. And they ended up being, uh, for a lack of a better term, the OSHA 10. Uh, Illinois Department of Labor has got a little bit of a hand on that here in, in, in Illinois here. So uh, that they, they referenced that a little bit. And what that's uh, you know, basically entailing here is uh, you know, our SCBR fit testing, the infection control training, uh, lockout tag out, confined space awareness, uh, respiratory protection policy training, hazmat ops refresher, HIPAA and HAZCOM type of stuff. And then we added in there the annual CPR recertification and an annual driver's course just to round it out a little bit. And that platform is being developed uh, for our guys in uh, Target Solutions. And basically our stance now moving forward is going to be either they complete that as scheduled or that's going to you know run through the disciplinary process and uh, you know basically take them off the schedule and not have them work here anymore for us so we're making sure that by using that platform we're getting all of those core things done uh, as a condition of continued employment and then the next part uh, I'm trying to be simple here is we broke out uh, our proficiency standards or kind of our minimum expectations and again I don't like the word minimum but uh, you know, it is what it is, uh, you know, just a comp competency or a performance-based system that for firefighter, engineer, officer, and shift commander, 
we came up with 12 topics and there are one of each of those four job descriptions scheduled per month. Uh, for example, you know, the firefighter might be doing SCBA donning, the engineer doing a basic, you know, hydrant hookup and, and sending water to a single line. The officer would be given a scenario to do an initial radio report and the shift commander would run a simulated mayday. So sometime during the course of the month, they have to do their minimum proficiency uh, evolution. And if, and, and, you know, through the course of the year, that gives them, you know, 12 opportunities to demonstrate minimum proficiencies. And moving forward here, that, that's going to be our, our general, you know, training plan is that they got to complete their core stuff to meet the requirements that are mandated. And then the proficiency things are going to be, well, show me you can do it type of thing from, you know, day one until, you know, they, you know, until they retire from the department. So in general, Seth, that's our, you know, kind of our plan moving forward. And, you know, around that is just the regular, uh, you know, the regular topics that burn, you know, they're, they're doing some live fire training this week and things like that around that. But uh, the, those are the must knows and the, and, and the, and the should knows uh, type of thing that we're trying to do. What about uh, two questions for you, Forrest? What about the the buy-in first of all, and then the second question would be, you know, what uh, what qualifications or or who gives them the stamp of approval that they, they can be the tester, right? Who's who's signing these guys off? Yeah, good good questions. Uh, the buy-in, uh, I hate to say it that way, but there there really isn't you know a, a choice when it comes to the core training requirements because those are mandated by. Department of Labor, a local standard, or our insurance company, like for the driver course and things like that, for example. So that that's a must do or you don't work here. And the rest of it is tied to our annual uh, performance evaluations now. So as our new uh, annual evaluation rolls out, uh, the, the proficiency standards that I mentioned, those are things that end up giving them points in their annual evaluation. So, um, you know, to me, I'm hoping the buy-in is that that helps them get to a, a specific level of, uh, you know, of, of their performance evaluation. Uh, so, so that that's kind of, you know, to, to the buy-in piece. Uh, and what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, the second part was, you know, who who has the authority to check these guys off with these skills? Um, it, well, the we're, we're, you know, because it's relatively new for us right now. We're in the process of of kind of filming the what right looks like. So, in target solutions for each of those standards. We'll have a short video clip of, of what we look at for the you know for the expected outcome, and then typically a majority of these are going to be based by the company officer, uh, the company officer you know taking care of their firefighter and their engineers, and then the shift commander taking care of the officers, uh, and then at my level, uh, when we have our monthly command staff training, uh, I'll be working with the shift commanders and uh, myself and the, and the operations or suppression deputy will take care of the. Uh, validations for the shift commanders. So we did. We basically just put a one level above, and all of our people have to be a minimum of instructor one uh, to to sign off on those things because some of it might be tied to certification or recertification credit too. We just had a unique thing happen with our department where we hired on a training captain that is on shift work, but a shift that is opposite of what the the rest of the guys are on. So he can touch each shift every week, but he's still part of the operational personnel. So he works a little bit of a different schedule. And so he can do the the competency piece, but we also have in Target Solutions and for actually on the drill ground, we have the company officers sign off because we do so much shift trades and there's so many people moving back and forth that we can always default back to the company officer saying, well, you know, you signed off on this guy, but he obviously can't throw this 24 foot ladder. So the, owners, the ownership is really on the company officer, which is supremely effective because they want to do a good job and they want to be the best shift and blah, blah, blah. How about yes, you, what do you guys do for military training? Uh, Seth, so if you want to, anybody wants to see that, I, I, I made up a quick one pager. If anybody wanted to see what some of that content was, if you just want to toss me an email, I'll be happy to send that out to anybody who uh, might get some value on that. So, yeah, great. What about you, Vince? Uh, what do you guys do up there in Antarctica? Uh, so we do something sort of similar. About two years ago, we started with competency-based uh, skill sheet stuff that we are rotating through. We started with the captains checking off, um, but we had a lot of pushback on they didn't know how to do the basic firefighting stuff. Um, it was a carryover from our recruit training that these are the standard skills. Uh, we picked up 12 practical skills that everyone should know as a firefighter. And uh, so this year we've gone to uh, training on the training ground and training officers assisting the captains going through how to use the evaluation sheets, which are skill sheets. Um, so that's where we are with the skill stuff. We do uh, online 
online training for knowledge and we have mandatory training that goes out and uh, there's a group of training officers that assess what we how many calls we had and what uh, from our uh, accident or injury reports and from our fire reviews stuff that's come up consistently and then we build out a two-year plan of what we're going to cover in theory we break it up into monthly for the career staff because they have to they have to do it and we can track them through our learning management platform and the volunteers we do it by quarter so they're given a bunch of theory stuff that they can do in one night all our lessons are basically 30 minutes for theory uh, and then they can bunch, bunch them all together in in one or two nights and then they have the rest of the nights to do their their practical components awesome uh lee just set up uh or just asked to uh statement uh, if you will on the chat that says uh you know were people willing to share these resources that they've already built out on target solutions and and that's a really easy thing to do it's when you're building your file center on target solution you can just ask it has a little icon there whether you want to share this with the rest of the community or not and it's a very powerful tool to get us connected as well through target solutions because it's just endless amounts of information out there as far as what other training officers do and you know target solutions has its limitations but the good the good piece about it is being able to um, share it across multiple platforms, with the, which is very effective. So something that, you know, I've been very passionate about over the last couple of years that we're trying to get to the end zone, uh, Drew and Forrester actually helped me quite a bit on this, is, is kind of this uh, virtual training officers resource guide. And what this is, is dovetailing on is about, I would say 12 years ago, Forrest, correct me if I'm wrong, but about 12 years ago or maybe 10, um, Chad Abel put out a product that was uh, directly in line with some research they put in of what is the minimum requirements for training for a training officer. So you kind of had this bulleted list with ISO, with OSHA, NFPA, on and on and on, based on your state or your organization. And I tried to expand on that. So it's a, a virtual three ring binder, if you will, that we're, we're formulating kind of what are all the JPRs for the standards? Um, what are your references as far as online goes? Um, any types of manuals, best practice manuals, all kind of encapsulated in this one document that you can hand feed the brand new person that walks through the ISFSI virtual door and say, hey, I'm a brand new training officer, what next? And here, here's the document. So um, if anybody wants to contribute to that project, you know, we're kind of in the collection stage and I, I feel like we'll, we'll have the, the delivery stage hit you guys probably no later than the end of July and it'd be in a polished document. But if anyone wants to reach out to me, um, S. Barker at bigskyfire.org and want to be part of that project and help out, that'd be great. Um, what else do we have here? Their next question is, uh, what resources do you need? That kind of goes right into what I was just saying is, is there anybody out there who's on the call or knows of anybody that is struggling and needs resources? Because again, that isfsi.org website where the thread can be created of it's been very powerful so far especially since you know we started going down the covid road as far um you know posting a thread and saying hey okay this is what i'm looking for who can help me out is there anybody on this call that's been starving for some something specific that we or we know people that can help you just fire that off in the chat room and uh and you know I think, uh, a, a, again, a great resource is our file sharing center on isfsi.org where there's already a lot of resources in there for you guys to navigate through as far as training props and, and whatnot go, and then some live fire standards and 1403 compliance and stuff like that. I just got a question for Bob Cross. Is, is that guide on the website now? No, it's not. The, the old document, as far as the ISO and the, and the NFPA and the OSHA requirements, um, is needs to be desperately updated. Um, and we need to have new eyes put on that. So everything is everything that we put on the website needs to be very polished and current and relevant, right? So that hasn't been put out there, but stay tuned. You know, this is something that uh, me and Forrest and Drew and Brian Kasmerzak have been working hard, hard on, and uh, I think it's going to be a pretty awesome document when it's all said and done. So I'm going to circle back to Forrest now because this is uh, kind of in his wheelhouse. Is uh, how do we navigate NFPA standards, Forrest? Uh, you kind of taught me a lot about this but a couple of years ago. So I think uh, I think you're the right guy to speak to this. All right, well, here's a short course on, on the NFPA standards. Um, four numbers matter, uh, and those are the prefixes. Uh, anything that begins with a 10, a 14, a 15, and a 19. 
that there's a couple of outliers in there. You might find a couple in the 18s, but for the most part, the job description of a training officer and an instructor reside in those four areas. Uh, anything that has a JPR has a 10 in the beginning of it. Anything that is a recommended practice for training officers and instructors begins with a 14. Uh, occupational health and uh, safety, you know, obviously those are the 15 standards specifically in chapter five uh, of the 1500 standard that, that gives you the real meat of the, what has to be in a training program. So it's a really good new language now that talks about uh, member responsibility. You know, the department provides the training, but it also gets heavily in the, uh, the member has to actually seek out the training type of thing. And then the 19, and a lot of people kind of give me a little bit of, you know, pushback on that a little bit. Why, you know, why is the equipment standards in there? But the equipment standards are in there because that's everything we we, we have to, to do our jobs. So if if as a training officer and instructor trying to build the guts of a program, anytime you're doing a uh, you, know, uh, you know training on you know, ropes and you know, ropes or you know structural gear, or PPE or SCBA, whatever, you want to be able to have access to the latest standards so you can see what the the use care maintenance, the capabilities and limitations, you know, those 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 types of things are from. So, uh, you know, personally, you know, the tens, they, you know, they are what they are. Those are the, you know, the minimum, you know, uh, standards to, to, to meet those proficiencies by the job description. Uh, but obviously having those things and and really, if anything, folks, if, if you just take out everything up to the word so that, Anything after so that becomes kind of the outcome, but but what you're looking for the for the firefighter or the student to do is everything right before the first comma where it says so that, and that that's what the core of the drill outcome has to be. You know, you're looking for them to understand, or you're looking for them to do uh, that part of it right before the uh, right before the so that. So um, so in all my years, that that's that's been the the core of what you know we need to know as 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 training officers and instructors. You know, again, there's other stuff out there, but that's where the main stuff is at: 10, 14, 15, 19, and you know, a few of the 18s. If you if you look in there, you can find a few that you know that that go in there day to day. So, so that's uh that's all I have to say about that, Seth. Well, what about uh what about the shall and should? Can you speak to that real quick? Sure. Yeah. That. Yeah. Sh shall and uh, should. Uh, you know, kind of the, the evil twins of each other. There. Uh, you know, shall means uh, if it's written in the standard, uh, the fire department shall provide a training program. The uh, you know the, the instructor shall you know type of thing. Shall means minimum compliance. Uh, that if you intend to be compliant with the standard, you have to obviously meet the full intent of what the section is. And the word should comes in. And, and typically that's followed by an asterisk, which tells you that you've got appendix language in the back of the standard. And what that basically means for us is that the authority having jurisdiction, the employer, the department, or the academy makes a management decision on how far they're going to take that part of, of, of the uh, recommended practice. You know, typically standards are in the tens. In the 14s, you'll see them listed as recommended practices and things. And then there's a little bit more leeway when it says should and that's where department by department or agency by agency, if you're an academy or something like that, where you'd make that management decision if that stuff is going to, you know, to actually, you know, be relevant to your department's operation there. So just watch those words. Those are the watch out words there. Yeah, that was that was a big aha moment for me when you explained that to me. Uh, Caleb has a great question. That's something that I uh, I've been struggling with my entire career with the. Uh, as a training officer, and you guys can read it in the chat, so I won't read it word for word. But, but basically, is how do we how do we drill or how do we train with varying levels of experience? And you know, in the beginning of my years as a training officer, I really always trained to the lowest common denominator because I felt like you know that was where we needed to kind of set the bar, so to speak. What I've found is moving forward, and I have this problem too, is that there's different varying levels of expertise across each shift based on what their interests are, to be honest, and what they're passionate about. And so I kind of take the high mark, take the low mark, and really try to train right in the middle. I know that's a cop-out answer, but what you'll find is, is the higher level operating firefighters will help train up the lower level firefighters because everybody wants to be high speed and, and train at the newest, greatest, greatest stuff out there. So if you kind of find that benchmark in the middle, and not cater towards that lower denominator because that you're really only catering towards one or two individuals on that shift or in that academy. Whereas you set the bar right in the middle, 
those guys will come up and then the, and the top shelf guys will help bring those guys up. Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Seth, I, I'm I'm not in with you right here because you can't go to the to the um, the weakest link. You have to set the standard in the middle. And one of the things that I find over the years, and, and Seth, I know you've seen it too, is that a lot of those hard charger, hard performers, are very passionate about certain parts of training or a certain topic, whether it's tech rescue or hose lays or whatever it might be. But when we challenge them to do just the basic sequence, they might not be as pre, pre, um, proficient as we think they are because they never practice it. So you kind of have to hold your ground and say, hey, this is this is where we're shooting for. You can do more than this, but you have to be able to do these minimum skills too. And uh, what you find is it's a good reminder or a good brush up for those seasoned folks to go practice that skill set again. Um, at least that's what I see in our organizations. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, the the what the guys and girls want to do out there is a little bit different than what you want to do. You know, my training program is most certainly mapped around whatever's wobbling plate for me. So what's stressing me out about the most in my personal training is usually what we train on. But I make a point to ask the guys, you know, what do they want to do or what's concerning them? And, that, and then I find a, lot, a huge boost in enthusiasm and passion when we're actually training on stuff that's stressing them out, you know, because uh, a lot of people, that's what makes a good team, right, is, is everybody's kind of had that different level of comfort with each skill set, so to speak. Uh, okay. Drew, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I sent a little, I said, be careful to not believe that the exceptional performers are the minimum standard. So I'll expound on that a little bit. In most of our organizations, most of our people can perform, most of our incumbents with any experience can perform at a level above the minimum standard. And quite frequently, as we bring in newer people and they learn skills, they quickly rise to that same level. But those who struggle may still be meeting the minimum standard, even though they're not exceptional performers. And we have to be cognizant of that because it's, it's a lofty goal to have everyone be exceptional performers. But the reality is, is that some people just aren't. They're always going to, you know, if, if you went to 10 high schools and took the Valley Victorian from each of those high schools and put them in a class together and gave a test, guess what's going to happen? Someone's going to be the best and someone's going to be the worst. But the worst may still meet all the objectives of the program. So we have to be cognizant of that. And I think that's really important in your volunteer or on-call organizations because those people have to want to be there. There's not a profit motive for them to be there. You can have a malcontent as a career firefighter, and we all know how that goes. But in a call organization, if you discourage people, and you know, years ago, John Buckman did a little bit on this, and he was talking about uh, firefighters who didn't necessarily have all the same attributes. And he's like, is it better to have an 80 percenter show up and we need two 80 percenters to pull on the halyard or not have anybody show up and the ladder never gets raised in the first place? So. I think we have to sometimes step back, analyze what we're trying to accomplish. I agree with Jason's comment. You've got to set realistic goals and you can't bring the organization down, but you can't expect too much out of them either. And the last thing I'll say is that your incumbents and your senior firefighters really need to be mentored to understand that they have an important role in the organization regardless of rank. And that is to bring people up, not put people down. And I don't mean, that they're probably not putting people down um, consciously or that it's not an orchestrated effort. But if the message is, I don't need to do that because I already know that, but you do, that's not leadership. Leadership is, I know how to do this. You need to know how to do this. Let's go learn to do it better together. And so that's a hard role. Uh, and you know, there's all kinds of organizational challenges. There's or, in combination organizations, if you have, uh, people on 24-hour shifts that are paid, full-time members, and then you have people who come in, whether they're volunteers or on call or part-time at night, and you get, well, I, I've worked all day. Well, guess what? They worked all day, too. They just weren't at the firehouse working. You know, you got the jackpot here, pal. You you, you got the full-time fire department job. They, many of them wish they were here. So there has to be that effort to put in to make people better and not, you go over there, I'm going to play Xbox or watch the TV over, over here. Yeah, I think uh, 
I think there's a lot of pressure on the company officer, and there's also a lot of pressure on the company officer to be the best at everything. Whereas at where we've been successful, at least, is, is recognizing that there is your your ace firefighter on forcible entry on your shift, and it's okay for that person to actually blow away his company officer in that in that tactic or in that that skill set and show the company officer a thing or two and and be open minded about that and have that company officer be open minded that they don't need to be the best at that or best at everything for that matter. You know, it's all about the team, not necessarily the individual. Hey Seth, just a comment. Uh, Damon made a great point about scenario-based training is a great opportunity to reinforce that. You don't have to be the best at everything because during that scenario-based training, there's multiple roles that those people can play to challenge their skill set. So if you have a person like Caleb's talking about where he's got a crew that's more senior folks, well, they all got to play a different role so they can all practice a different skill set. One of them might be practicing the, the company officer role and the decision making, while the other one's practicing the entry level firefighter role, which is deploying a hose line and doing those skills. But in that scenario, they get a, a vast amount of opportunity to practice at different levels inside of one simple event. Yeah, you know, and, and within that scenario based training is also making it as realistic as possible. So getting away from talking about it and sitting around the fire engine and saying, well, I would have done this. It's show me how you've done it and show me what the skill is and do it and do it again and do it again and do it again, because it's got to be realistic. So, you know, for example, you know, simulating putting on your SCBA before you make an entry. I mean, that's just that's a no go. You can put on your SCBA and show me you can do it. Right. So it's it's demonstrating what, what it looks like. Right. Yeah, and I think we use a scorecard by using a stopwatch and having um, individual times for each portion of those scenarios. So that way we can set a standard to judge performance. So we might tell you to doff an SC or don an SCBA and deploy a hose line and flow water. Well, that's great, but if it takes you 17 minutes to do that, that's not being proficient at that skill set. So we put 90 seconds on it that you had to be flowing water from a parked apparatus within 90 seconds. That's your scorecard. If you don't make 90 seconds, you practice it until you do make it. And we do that for everything from extrication to um, we're working on EMS stuff and doing other um, specialty skills with a time-based scenario that we can judge them on or score them on. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Chief Hoppel from Billings, Montana. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I, you know, one thing that's worked really well for us, and, I, and I've said it in the past, and, you know, going back to one of the big problems we had is we'd have monthly training, organized training, where you bring everybody together, we're going to all perform a skill. And generally, it would be that company officer that would dress down and, and allow the, the firefighter engineer to do the work because they know what they're doing and don't need to show that competency. So we've kind of moved to that quarterly based training, we would we would issue those videos through Target Solutions um, on a three month basis, show the basic skills, even the, even the company level officer skills that can be practiced at that station level. Um, they practice those skills at that station level, firefighter works on his basic skills, company officer works on his size ups or whatever he's doing, and they all exchange roles in the station and practice each other's skills. And then we meet on that quarterly basis and you know we do time stamp it we do put times to it so we can you know competency level and then we bring everybody together as a multi-company and they practice those skills multi-company and and now everybody's active everybody's doing a skill you know based on what they'd be normally performing and you know realistic based scenarios uh whether it be through live fire or just uh, simulated smoke, whatever it is. That way, everybody's involved. We had to overcome. And now we have a company officer who's truly performing his job as, you know, he's he's the teacher. He's the mentor for that crew. He, he should be teaching them and guiding them, you know, what they should be learning. So that's something we haven't had in the past either. We, you know, the training office used to deliver all of our training. You know, we'd have certain instructors that come in and do all the training. Now the company officer is taking an active role in taking care of his crew and our training office is in our, in our battalion chiefs are taking an active role in taking care of our company officers and the training office is giving them the tools. So 
it, it, it's been very successful. It's a, it's a first year out for that. So, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I, in the past, it's just been that company officer has been uncomfortable because they didn't just come out of recruit school. They don't know what those basic skills are. And then we've got the new firefighter that doesn't want to tell his company officer how to do his job. And, and now we're able to do that because we, we put these videos out with our people, with our equipment, doing the skill. It's not a, a canned video that we pulled off the air and we do it through Target Solutions. And so they're checked off through those three months on those competencies and then the actual, you know, checking off the, the third party, scoring them that they're doing it right. It, you know, it all comes together and everybody benefits. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Uh, you know, I think the best best time I can remember in my training was, you know, in paramedic school, riding with a busy engine company and having that oversight with with somebody to be able to make those mistakes. And it, gonna, it was OK to make mistakes because that person had my back and was going to help me um, not make those mistakes in the field. And I use that analogy a lot because you know, we get those firefighters out of academy or or the readiness academy or whatever you guys call it in your organization. Uh, their their tips are sharp, man. They're they're ready to go they're, and they're hungry and they're ready to show everybody what that looks like too. And sometimes that can be intimidating as well on the other end, just like you said. So empowering them to be like, hey, it's okay that you know we haven't done uh, mayday drills for this year, but you just did them for a week straight. So let's see what you got and show the rest of us how to do it. You know, and, and let's sharpen our 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 weapons so to speak all right good good stuff uh chief leave you still on there yes i'm on i was just typing so now i yes. don't have to type <laughs> so how do you navigate a huge organization you know i just got a very small glimpse of your training program and and i just can't even fathom you know i'm only in charge of 35 guys i can't even imagine what you're going through so maybe if you could speak a little bit to that of, of keeping everybody sharp and and training and keeping training in the four month for in the forefront of their mind yeah so i love the point that somebody brought up about the company officer doesn't have to be the best at everything um he has to understand that he's not going to be i'm thinking in my career i know plenty of firefighters that are better at forcing a door than I'll ever be. And I always defer to expertise during training. That's that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength when you do that. And um, the question I was gonna write to, to the group is, how many departments does rank automatically equal the smartest, right? I mean, you have to recognize that there's plenty of people at every stage in the organization that are going to be a subject matter expert in something, uh, you know, much better than you. I think about um, Bobby Morris and Rex Morris and forcible entry in the FDNY. You know, those guys have been the experts in forcible entry since they were firefighters, you know, as they moved up the ranks. So um, anyway, so that's what I was going to ask the group and wonder how, how everybody handles that. But as far as for us, the company officer is responsible for the daily training. Um, and as far as the competency and making sure, that's typically something that would be done. Um, so the company office is making sure they have the competency, but the real competency for us comes when we take when we bring them to the fire academy and we test them on the on the skills. But the daily training, nothing takes the place of a, of a good company officer. And so do you guys, Chief, do you guys um, leave that up to the company officer for subject matter? Or is that something that's get pushed out from your office saying, hey, this month we're doing this? No, so that's a great question. We have a, a, a digital drill calendar that gets pushed out and it has videos and, and uh, all sorts of material for the company officer that is, um, you know, so he knows like whatever, it could be hose line stretch, it could be fire escape, it could, whatever the topic of the day is, if he doesn't have anything specific that he wants to drill on, he defaults to the, to the calendar and typically has five or six resources at his disposal at least that he could bring up and run and run as the drill. So that's especially important, providing the resources, which has also been a big part of today's conversation. For the, um, for the, for the company officer, especially the, the newer company officer, it's critically important because he likely hasn't run a lot of drills as a firefighter, unless you gave him, unless he was that subject matter expert or somebody gave him the opportunity uh, you know, earlier in his career, which is less often. Very good point. You know, 
what I think is extremely effective is again showing them like a lot of people have been posting on the chat room here is is showing them of what right looks like with a video more importantly you know showing the training officer or the company officer doing that skill and then supplying the the student if you will or the people about to do the training with a robust robust amount of information for them to reference so they have the skill sheet or the JPR or whatever that looks like, they have a video showing what that looks like and then they have clear objectives that they have to meet. So when they do hit the drill ground and it is time to train, there's not that lag of, of that education that either whoever's leading that train or not um, has to have and digest, right? It's we can just simply work on the actual task at hand. Um, yeah, it's my job to, yeah, it, that, I agree. It's, it's our job, it's my job to set him up for success and giving him the resources that he can do. He got to that position for a reason. So now I just need to su support what he's doing. Pete, did you have something to add? You're muted, Pete. You're still muted. I, I've just been enjoying the conversation, actually. Uh, yes, so my, my comment was, uh, you know, when you're trying to reach and that broad group of people, right? You're never going to have standard competency across the organization. It's just, it's not going to happen. Um, and and so it's always, it's always going to be a struggle, but that needs to be part of the message, right? Is that we don't succeed. You might have the, the best shift on the department, but Mrs. Smith doesn't know to have her emergency on your shift. She's going to have her emergency when she has it, right? So we, we've all got to get to this and be striving for this mastery. We're only as good as a department as our worst company in, in some way, shape or form. And we, we all have to acknowledge that and all be working toward that collective mastery, not, you know, and, and you get there in a variety of different ways. But um, to me, those two things come together, right? You're never going to master everything you need to master on this job. You're just not. So as good as you are, you've got room to improve. And when everybody comes to the table with that sort of, oh my God, I am so incompetent, I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, what can I do today to fix that a little bit? Um, I, I actually found that, that 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 helps. We all we all recognize that we've got something to to learn today, to improve on. You know, make that little step going forward. And when that becomes the the attitude and the paradigm of the organization in terms of training then I think it becomes less difficult to meet those different needs because everybody recognizes in some way, shape or form, I stumble too. So I want to, I want to bring you up Seth, because you just might, I might need you to have my back next time. So I'm going to make sure I have your back this time. And I, I think when you're trying to reach those guys and motivate them that building that sort of attitude and approach can get you a long way because then they have ownership. And I think a lot of you spoke to that, directly or indirectly is that a lot of the key to this success is how much ownership do the guys have and the companies have about their success? How much ownership do they feel they have? How much responsibility do they take? One of my earliest mentors taught me that the key to success in a, in a team effort is you as the instructor or the leader have to convince the team that they are wholly responsible for their success. It's all up to them. And at the same time, you as the leader have to understand that it's wholly up to you. And if you can pull that off, you're gonna win. And every single time, you go undefeated. But that's why teams don't go undefeated. It's really hard to pull that off. And I hope that makes a little bit of sense. And I'll stop rambling now. No, it makes complete sense to me. You know, uh, something that I, I overemphasize, probably a little bit too, probably a little too brutal is that, you know, my kids and my wife don't know that you're on your phone during the last train and not paying attention. They're expecting a level of confidence for you to get in there and help them. And that seems to be effective. That seems to work pretty good, um, especially when you put a little bit of humanity involved in it of, of, hey, you know, put the phones down. This is important. Nobody's that good. Um, pay attention and let's get the job done. Uh, Nicholas, uh, we need to do a better job sharing resources at ISFSI. Man, amen. I, I can't overemphasize that enough. And that's really honestly where this uh, train, officers, train officers resource guide is coming from, is everybody says they're gonna put stuff on our platform. And then, it, then we get into this jumble of, well, I'm teaching it, so it's intellectual property and I need to blah, blah, blah. And I just, as soon as somebody says intellectual property to me, I'm checked out with that person for life. So 
I, I think that we need to do a better job at sharing everything. And, and just because you have somebody else's stuff doesn't mean you can teach their stuff. So let's get over that a little bit. Sorry to get on my soapbox, but um, let's, let's do a better job at everybody on this call and everybody that you know and connected to of sharing their resources. And what we got to keep in mind is, is that, you know, the organization is key. And what I mean by the organization is the organization of the resources. So if we're just firing stuff out on the resource center, it becomes very challenging to navigate. And so the big push for this train officer resource guide or this virtual three ring binder is to have, okay, here's our fire one skills. Here's our fire two skills. Here's our instructor one skills. Um, here's our training officer skills. And having to be in very organized on the front end so you can navigate through there and get and see what you're looking for um, very, very quickly and not wasting time with that. Um, anybody have any questions about that or anything to add about that? Okay, we're kind of in the home stretch here. The last last bullet point I want to talk about is the is the ISFSI training officer credentials. So my personal journey through this was, you know, when it when I was trying to be a a, a front person on the ISFSI train, so to speak, I, I thought it was really important for me to obtain all these credentials so I knew what I was talking about. And I was dragging my feet hard with the training officer credential because I felt like I was going to be reliving the pain of instructor one and instructor two. However, I think I, I very much believe in this class. I think this class and maybe if Chief Hopple's still on the on the line, he can speak to it too. Me and him went through it together. Um, it really forces you to address in kind of a holistic approach your entire training program. And it is in fact instructor one, instructor two, and dabbles in instructor three, which is program management. And it forces you to take a look at your organization or what you're doing and look at the bigger picture rather than just the company officer level, but truly the training officer level of, of uh, implementing and planning and executing training within your organization. So the plan is moving through is, is to have this be a online delivery and have all the students not be on site, but actually be in the virtual classroom attending the lecture and then having a very similar timed uh you know happy hour so to speak meeting so everybody can share their information because the the meat of that class is getting 15 training officers together around the country and saying what do you guys do in halifax nova scotia compared to what do you guys do in big sky montana compared to what do you guys do in oakland california and that's where i think the rubber really meets the road so that's that's in the works between, uh, I think there's four virtual instructors that we're gonna start using the, the brand new LMS platform that ISFSI's got for the live fire and fixed facility um, training. And then moving forward, I think it's gonna be a very easy for people to navigate um, through this class. And, and I, can't, I can't speak more to it, you know, and it, and it really helps you get that CTO designation because it's directly in line through the CPSC to get that CTO designation um, a big bulk of this class counts towards that. So stay tuned for that. If you don't have that credential, you got questions about that credential, please, you know, fire them off to me. Um, Matt, do you have anything to add about that credential? Uh, no, I think you've covered most of it, but it, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. It was, uh, it came at the right time in my career. I, you know, I was handed a training office with, without the keys. <laughs> and this basically, you know, it, it gave me the keys I needed and everything I needed to cover um, being coming into that new position, you know, lots of different subjects, you know, uh, and especially that that networking amongst those departments, because there's departments of every size in that class and the projects that you work on, you know, it, it gets you going in that position. So, uh, yeah, I, I just just to, dovetail on what you just said. It's, you know, if anybody needs to know more about that class, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to help out and, and get and get get more people involved in it and where it's going. Yeah, and you know, I don't want to I don't want to scare people away from it either because it is work. You got to put some work into it. You know, you can't just start doing it the day before class shows um, starts, right Matt? Yeah, we found that out. I think we were the pilot course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Matt had a, had a tough first couple of days there, but we we pulled it off. Um, 
So we're going to finish up with, with a couple questions here. Caleb's uh, lighting us up pretty good, and I appreciate that. So Caleb's, uh, how do I communicate all this and my attentions to trying to, sorry, I just lost my position here. Better preparing the firefighters without insulting them. You know, um, this is the challenge, right? It is making sure everybody feels empowered, making sure everybody feels um, trusted and safe on the drill ground too, and that you're not going to think poorly of somebody for not performing well and try not to insult them in the process. And that's that's the training officer's game right there is trying to make everybody still be engaged, still learning something and not shutting them down. You know, I'm, I have a very unique situation in my organization that that's just like this of, you know, borderline people not having faith in certain other people's competency level. And that's where you got to train up or train down. You know, you got to set that bar right in the middle and, and execute and not accept low standards. Jason. Hey, Seth. Yeah. So we try to put that kind of attitude back on the folks that have it. Um, when we see folks that are acting like that, we try to say, okay, well, if you know it so well, how about you take them over into a group and you train them? Uh, you know, since you're so great at this, then, uh, you know, help them along, do your job and mentor them up. Uh, and then the other thing we try to do is you have to make the training fun. You have to keep it different and you can't keep doing the same standardized drill 01-12 every January or 03-14 every March uh, because they're going to come in, they're going to go through the motions, they're going to jump through the hoops, they're going to get back on the truck and go back to the station. Um, so you've got to keep everything, uh, you know, fluid and always be adding some sort of different dimension to it uh, so that uh, they don't get stuck in a rut. Good stuff. Uh... I just want to reiterate with Caleb, uh, you know, I was this in this exact same position like Chief Hoppe was of, you know, getting thrown in the training department in my organization and saying, okay, do it. And that's when I, and uh, the big pivotal moment in my career was meeting Drew Smith, Forrest Reader, Tim Cassidy, Brian Kasmer, Zach, Randy Trost, Billy Goldfeder. And these guys helped me come up through the ranks in my organization. So there's never too many questions. There's never... You're not a pain for asking questions or wanting resources. Caleb, my, my email is sbarker at bigskyfire.org. I'm going to type that up here in a second. And, man, I'm going to share everything I have with you. And I'm sure everybody on this call will do the same exact thing. I know Drew and Forrest did it for me. And so please let me pay it forward to you. Uh, so this, there's another question in there. Is CTO different than instructor one? So CTO is the designation through CPSE, like fire officer, chief training officer, and then uh, executive uh, What's the last one? Uh, somebody help me out. Anyways, uh, so those are designations through the Center of Public Safety and Excellence. And then the Instructor 1 Instructor 2 are, they can be, but they're most most popular through an IFSAC Pro Board certification. So different than a designation, meeting a certain standard as far as instructor level goes. Uh, I'm going to type up my email here real quick. Uh, Jason, you got anything to add? You know, Seth, I think we see the value, again, having Drew and and Forrest and you and Peter and all the folks on the line sharing. Uh, all of us come from different backgrounds and different organizations. So, you know, a combination volunteer or a large career department like, like Frank's, uh, you know, there's something we can learn from all of us. And, and I think what we're finding is the connecting this way uh, in this format it's allowing us to do that in a very simple process. So I appreciate it, Seth and Lee, for, for all the hard work on it. Yeah, awesome. So I think with that, we're going to uh, kind of end this unless, uh, you know, Forrest or Drew, you guys got anything to add, your words of wisdom to cap it all off here? I, no, it was a good uh, break to listen to. All right. Training is the most influential position in the organization. Um, as a chief, you can set the vision, but as the training officer, you make things a reality. I just want to go back to a comment that I seen earlier, and it's about we, you know, they don't instructors want don't want to have their students fail or teach them to fail. You know, that's our job. Teachable moments, we want to call them. If we if we're if we're doing a training mission or doing a training skill, and we see them doing something wrong, it's how we deliver. 
you know, we want to be the best instructor that we do and take that as a teachable moment and walk walk through that process rather than ridicule them and, and just call them out for failure. Take teachable moments. Awesome. Forrest? All good here. Just worried about Pete's hair. I don't know if that's a new, uh, new piece that he's modeling there for us or if that's COVID hair there. So. I have let's, not, uh, let's, all send, let's all send Peter our best. I've been this long in 40 freaking years. <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, if Don't hesitate to reach out to me or Jason if you have any questions, need any resources. If I don't have the answer or Jason doesn't have the answer, we can most certainly point you in the right direction. And uh, let's keep this going. This is, this is great stuff. It's definitely the highlight of my week. I look forward to it. And... Uh, yeah, share some resources, get it, get on our, our website, um, contribute, pay it forward, and we'll see you guys next week. Jason, do you remember what we're doing next week? I forget. I don't, but it brings up the topic. We need your your uh, influence in the topics. Uh, Seth and myself and Lee and others have been you know pulling these out of the air, but we could really use your input into what you want to see, and then we'll go find experts to help bring in uh, – you know, experts into those topics to share with you also. So if you have information or challenges in front of you that you you need help with, please share them with us through Lee and, and uh, we'll go to work on lining up programs for them to share through this this uh, model. So thank you. And I wanna, I wanna dovetail on that. There are many of you out there that could be leading one of these discussions and you should be. It should not be us, the same heads. I mean, we're more than happy to do it, but there's a lot of talent out there, a lot of, you know, and you need to you need to step up. So if you got something, you got a topic you want to lead the discussion on, bring that to our attention and we'll turn it over to you one of these weeks. We got plenty of opportunity here. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Drew. Thanks, Forrest. Thanks everybody for jumping on. We'll see you guys next week. Be safe out there. Good job, everybody. Have a good week.